Uh, like everybody here, on occasion, uh, I myself have, um, have had to deal with someone who offended me for some reason or other. It happens. And um, if I kind of examine my own feelings during those times, uh, while going through this experience, I realize how easily and quickly you can hurt or offend somebody. I mean, just a word, just a word, describing something with the wrong word or the wrong emphasis or you, you know, the type of smile you have in your face when somebody says something or just body language. It doesn't take you know, an hour to offend somebody. Just, it happens very, very, uh, very quickly. However, how long it can take to sort out all of your feelings over something that may have taken place in just a few moments, that, that's a whole other thing. You know, something happens in like two seconds, but it takes you two weeks to kind of sort out all your feelings about it. That's the thing about you know, being offended. I suppose the most difficult issue to deal with when these things happen is how do I respond as a Christian? Uh, that's always the big problem. How do I respond as a Christian? You know, if I were not a believer, there would be various responses to offenses, chief of which would be revenge. <laughs> you know, I mean, if there's no God and no judgment at the end, then I am going to exercise judgment. I'm going to take revenge. I'm going to get even or at best justice or closure. But responding as a Christian when offended is a more difficult and demanding thing. We know that the basic idea is to react with love, but how do you express that love to someone with whom you are in conflict? That's the problem. Now there are many passages in the New Testament that deal with this very problem. And this evening I'd like to examine a few of them that teach us how we should respond to our enemies. Well, first of all, let's talk about non-Christian enemies. We need to realize that we have different kinds of enemies, don't we? And God helps us to respond to each kind of enemy that we have in different ways. For example, we have non-Christian enemies. Those who offend us, oppress us, are against us in some way or another, but they themselves are non-believers. For this kind of enemy, Jesus says, do not resist him who is evil. Well, who are you talking about when you're saying don't resist him who is evil? Obviously a non-Christian or a person who is one in name only but whoever slaps you on the right cheek, he says, that turn to him the other also, Matthew 5, 39. And it's interesting, all the examples that he gives in this passage all deal with people who are not, you know, not Christians. Of course, Jesus is using a highly dramatic image here to make his point. But in everyday language, how do we turn the other cheek? Well, Paul answers that question in Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 is the how to turn the other cheek. So in practical terms then, he is saying when someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to him the other in the following way. Number one, don't seek revenge. And we should go to Romans 12, by the way. Let me just read that passage before I get into the explanation. Romans chapter 12. Uh, going down to verse 17. He says, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. And if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him, and if he is thirsty, give him a drink, for in so doing you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is, this is how you turn the other cheek to someone who is not a Christian who has offended you. Number one, he says, don't seek revenge. It may be appealing, it may be satisfying, it may be justifying, but don't you do it, 
he says. Secondly, don't escalate. Seek peace instead. Your goal after your offense is to create a peaceful environment. This is what you need to be doing, not plotting revenge. You know, I've been offended by that person. What am I going to do? I have to do something. OK, try to create an environment of peace with that person. That's what you need to be, quote, doing. Number three, he says, overcome the evil thing that was done to you with good. Prayer, excuse me, pray for the enemy. Bless them if the opportunity arises. This replaces the evil thing done with good things. Sometimes you, know, you don't have access to that person. They live in, you know, uh, I don't know, Las Vegas somewhere and you live over in New York. You, know, you don't get to see that person. You know, how can you create the environment of good? How can you do something good for that person? Well, you can always pray for that person. You can always keep that person in your prayer. That's one way of turning the other cheek. Our responsibility toward our non-Christian enemy is not revenge or even justice, but rather a witness of God and a witness of our faith with Christ. So to the question that is asked, well, what do I do now? I've been offended, I've been, you know, what do I do now? Yeah, seek to create a witness for God before that person. We need to show our enemies the person and the love of Christ, not our ability to take revenge or to exact justice. Now, I'm not saying that Christians have no recourse to human justice or law when they are wronged. I mean, Christians can and should appeal to law and justice in this world. This is right. This is biblical. You know, Paul appealed to Caesar to avoid a murder plot on his life, Acts 25 verse 11. And you know what, if I am robbed and the police catch the guy that robbed me, I will go to court, I will press charges, I will work within the law. And if I am violated, I will testify in court against my attacker. Well, we've not been called to, to be rug mats, you know, uh, doormats. Human justice and human law and its enforcement has been given to man by God for the purpose of mitigating evil in this world, Romans 13, 1. And through its proper exercise, criminals are punished. Evil nations are restrained. Society is protected. For this reason, Christians can use it and participate in its function and should do so in order for God's will in these matters to be done towards the guilty. However, regardless of the workings of human justice, which we must submit to in dealing with our enemies, get this now, our personal relationship with our non-Christian enemies exists on another plane, on a higher plane. The ultimate and most recent example uh, or test case for this, uh, we've just gone through that, you know, the uh, Osama bin Laden, right, the terrorist leader, killed a little while back by American Navy SEALs. Talk about the ultimate enemy, right? He masterminded 9-11, which killed thousands of people and caused many other deaths and wars and inconveniences and suffering around the world at the hands of other terrorists for the last decade at least. He qualifies as, as an enemy. Human justice and American military enforcement were meted out to him after a long and costly search. The opinion of most people is that, well, he received what he deserved and, and they're happy about it but my personal attitude toward him continues to be, turn the other cheek. Why? Because what human justice and law does is different from what I do as a Christian. Why? Because law and justice are regulated by the world, for the world, for the purpose of peace and safety under the administration of God. There's a place for justice. But my response is regulated by the kingdom of God for the purpose of witnessing my faith in Christ. You see what I'm saying? 
I'm reacting to enemies as a Christian in a different way than the law and justice are reacting to my enemy. What the law does and what I do, those are two different things. And I can do this because regardless of what human justice does or does not do, God promises perfect justice in the end. Even if they never caught that guy, even if that guy disappeared somewhere and lived the life of luxury until he was 100 years old and then died in his sleep, it's okay. Justice for him will come. Maybe not human justice, but divine justice will come. My responsibility as a Christian is still to turn the other cheek. I pray for my enemies, even while my enemies may be sought after by the law and judged by justice, I still pray for them. Why? Because that's what turning the other cheek demands of me. Now, someone might say, well, what do you do when the enemy is the government or the state? Well, when the enemy is our own government, I believe that Christians have three options. First, we use the law as it exists to oppose it. You know, the civil rights movement used this nonviolent approach to challenge unfair laws. Again, I refer to Paul appealing to Caesar for a fair hearing according to Roman law. He didn't, do, do you read anything in Paul's writings where he tries to stir up the Christians to come and march outside the Sanhedrin or, you know, or start a, start a guerrilla war and start you know, killing off high, the high priest and the, uh, some of the Pharisees you know, to get justice. He didn't do that. He used the law, but he didn't work to undermine the government, even if it was wrong in this case. Another thing we can do is to stand up and speak truth to power. I don't know if some of you are familiar with the writer, philosopher, he was a minister, a Lutheran, I think, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was a minister in World War II Germany and he denounced and he exposed the Nazis for what they were doing. And in no little time he was jailed and then ultimately executed. But his works were the guiding light of many Germans who resisted Nazi domination. You know, Peter the Apostle, who continued to witness Christ Despite threats from the Jewish leaders in the Sanhedrin, he spoke truth to the power of that day. We can do that. We actually live in a country where the law gives us permission to do that. And then three, we can always flee to a safe place. This is the difficult choice of many refugees today, you know, trying to escape evil governments all around the world. Christians who escaped Jerusalem after the death of Stephen in Acts 14. One of their own was killed. Did they go out and march in the street? Did they try to kill you know, again? Did they try to undermine, overwhelm, topple the government, start a, uh, you know, a, a, a war of retribution? No. They fled for their lives. They brought the gospel with them. It's a good thing that they did. So Christians were not anarchists. We're not terrorists. We're not guerrilla fighters aiming to overthrow governments by force. Of course, revolutions, even just ones, occur. But this is not what we as Christians are called by Christ to do. The early Christians did not plot any effort to overthrow the evil and corrupt Roman government. Our faith and our hope is in God to help us stand up or to find safety and have the wisdom to know when to do which. We have to turn the other cheek even when the enemy is the state. God is greater than any government and He will let it stand or defeat it in His own way and in His own time. Do you ever think about that? When we're, you know, the, all, <laughs> the election coming up, and I'm not going to get into that, you know, Whoever wins is not going to win because of an October surprise or the machinations of their, you know, uh, of their people you know, plotting and planning and ripping each other apart and the media. You know, that's, not, that's not why they're going to win. Whoever wins gets in because God has permitted it. 
We might not understand. We, we might say to God, Lord, how, why, why did you permit this person to become the leader of? We, we don't always understand the why. But I guarantee you, brothers and sisters, no one gets to be the leader of this nation without God's permission. He permits it. He may not like it. His permission that someone leads is not necessarily a blessing on that person's you know, opinions and, and actions, but he permits it. Every king, every leader ever lived reigned because God permitted it. Our number one responsibility as Christians toward our non-Christian enemies is to witness Christ to them, not to defeat them. That's why Jesus chose to die on the cross rather than call on the angels to save Him. If we have made a good witness, we have completed our task regarding our non-Christian enemies and those who offend us. So you know, you know, I've said a lot here, can I just shrink this down to, into a bite size? What is my responsibility towards my non-Christian enemy who offends me or who, or who harms me? What is my goal with that person? My goal is to witness to them, not defeat them, not exercise judgment on them or justice on them. There are other things, other uh, entities that will work to do that. My job is witness, always. Okay, how about when a Christian offends us. Well, when a non-Christian offends, you know, the goal is not to forgive, but to witness. Because our non-Christian enemies, they don't care about forgiveness. Your forgiveness doesn't save their soul. However, if your witness can bring them to Christ, then they will receive forgiveness from God. And as new Christians, your forgiveness will then have meaning to them. Now for Christians who offend you, however, the goal is not witness, the goal is forgiveness. But again, the New Testament gives us several different situations where this forgiveness can be worked out. Go in your Bibles to Luke 17 if you have them. Luke 17 beginning in, uh, beginning in verse one. He, says, he said to his disciples, it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come, but woe to him through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he would cause one of these little ones to stumble. Be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times saying, I repent, forgive him. Now Jesus is speaking here specifically about your brother, your Christian brother or sister. Now it's hard to imagine someone offending us you know, seven different times in one day and returning for forgiveness each time. But Jesus is saying even if they did, He would ask you to offer that forgiveness. Now this example reminds me of that brother or sister who because of some personality fault or habit or attitude, that person offends me all day long. You know people like that? You don't want to even be with them because just the way they are or just the smile or just their attitude or their tone of voice or their body language, it just gets on your nerves. They don't just defend, I'm not going to name names. They all go to the morning service anyway. So. <laughs> my, my only comment to God about these people in my life is, why? <laughs> why? Why are these people in my life? I believe that the answer God gives that He wants us to grow through the discipline of forgiveness. That's the answer to the why. People that challenge us to repeated acts of forgiveness cultivate in our character all kinds of virtues including patience, tolerance, graciousness, kindness and ultimately Christian love. In other words, the repeated acts of forgiveness cultivates in us a loving character. You know, if you have ever asked God to teach you to love or to expand your capacity for love, 
His answer will be that He will put you in a spiritual gymnasium and He will make you repeat the exercise of forgiveness over and over and over again in all of its forms. So you want bigger heart? You want bigger capacity to love? Get ready to be offended. Because forgiving inconvenient circumstances and weak people will develop patience in you. And forgiving differences of opinions and status and ability and maturity will develop tolerance in you. And forgiving offenses and pettiness and unkindness and slanders will develop graciousness in you. And forgiving weakness and slowness and poverty and immaturity and ignorance will develop kindness in you. As you forgive repeatedly, the character of love will overtake and eventually superimpose itself on your character, on my character. That's why learning how to forgive is so important in the development of a mature Christian character. Number two, dealing with the unrepentant offender. That's a different thing. Let's go to Matthew. Let's go to Matthew. You're familiar with this one. Matthew 18. Matthew 18. This is the unrepentant. You see, at first he says, if your brother offends you, and then he comes and asks for forgiveness. Okay, forgive us seven times, right? But sometimes the brother or sister who offends us is not repentant. There is no repentance. How do you deal with that brother? Well, that's what he talks about in Matthew 18, uh, beginning in verse 15. He says, if your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. I like that every fact may be confirmed. It's not, it's not every impression you have. He doesn't say, so that every suspicion you have, or every emotion you have, or every word that people have been gossiping to you about this other person you have. He says a couple of extra witnesses, so those witnesses can confirm the facts. Things that have actually happened, that they have seen and they know, and that they understand are, 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 are wrong. Okay, very important. Then in verse 17 he says, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So sometimes there's a person who offends you or the church and is unrepentant. A lot of times they don't even know they've offended you. The greatest single cause of division and strife and heartache among church members is that they do not follow this teaching when it comes to dealing with others who have knowingly or unknowingly offended them or sinned against the church. How do you sin against the church? Well, you claim and everybody outside the church knows you as a Christian, but you act like a heathen. We don't have to get into the how. We know what sin is. That's sinning against the church, an immoral lifestyle or an unfaithful lifestyle. Now what people usually do is they tell or they complain to somebody else. Notice at the very beginning what Jesus says. If your brother offends you, what does he say? Go to that Brother, how? In private. That is the most disobeyed <laughs> rule in the New Testament, in the church. Because if we're offended, usually the first thing we do, we tell somebody else. We tell somebody else, you know Joe, is there any Joe Weaver? Sorry Joe Weaver. Uh, we tell somebody else, you know Joe, 
He, you know what he said to me? Blah, 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 blah. Well, that's terrible, person B over here says. That's terrible. Well, we ought to do something about that. Well, yeah, what? Well, let's go tell somebody else over there. Let's form a posse. And we wonder why we can't you know, resolve these things inside the church. We have trouble resolving these kinds of things inside, of a inside a family of eight or nine people. Can you imagine how, trying to resolve this thing in a family of 400 people? You've got unlimited people to gossip with. Or the other way. The person who has been offended represses their feelings of anger and let it simmer and boil and stew in silent resentment towards that person or that person's. And they give that person you know, whatever, the 20% silent treatment or the 80% you know, the 20% silent treatment is uh, uh, I'll hand you a bulletin and I'll say good morning. You know, it's just, you know, the 90% silent treatment is I won't look at you, I won't talk to you, I will change, you know, I'm not even sitting where I used to sit because that's where you, you know, or we do that instead. It's like being in junior high. Brothers and sisters, what the Lord says here, this is not an option. Jesus says that if your brother sins, not just the perception or gossip of sin, but you can actually substantiate that an offense has occurred, you must, A, go to that person in private to settle the matter. This means that you tell them in a loving manner what the problem is and how you feel and, and, and you know, how you believe this situation has been offensive to you. That's where to start. Is that easy to do? Well, no. Why? Because what might happen is that person may offend you a second time. <laughs> but you have to take that risk. And then B, if they don't respond, you bring several concerned brethren with you who know about the situation. You bring people who are interested in making things right, not just proving that you're right. You don't bring a lynch mob with a rope. C, if you fail, the church must know. Perhaps the weight of opinion and concern by the church will bring this person to repentance and a willingness to make peace. Now when we talk about, quote, the church at this point could be represented by the elders, for example, who speak on behalf of the church, but certainly the entire church is made aware somehow. And then finally, D, if the person refuses to respond even to the appeal and the encouragement of the body, the church, then the church must turn away from this person and treat them as a disobedient and rebellious child. We're not taking away their salvation. Some people say, well, I, I, can't, you know, I can't decide if a person is going to hell or not. Well, that's not what you're doing anyway. What you're doing is you're calling this person out and saying, you see this thing? Like in 99 other things, you're a wonderful person, but in this one area here, there's a sin, there's a something that needs to be changed and you need to change it. And until you do, you cannot enjoy uh, the fruit of Christian fellowship. We need to take care of this matter first. It, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, preachers, preachers that I've known, especially working out in the mission field, they, they're, they're saying, well, how do you handle this? You know, the guy calls me, let's call him Joe, he's a troublemaker. You know, he calls me and he wants to talk to me about this and that and the other thing, you know, and, and how do I handle that? And I tell them, this is how you handle that. When the phone rings and it's Joe and he starts in on, so did you see the game yesterday? Or you know, what's going on? He's trying to be friendly. You need to politely and lovingly say, Joe, have you called me in order that we can talk a bit about resolving that issue? Uh, no, well then we don't have anything to talk about. The game or the weather or, yeah, we got nothing to talk about. This thing is in the way for us to kind of get back to talking about and doing these other things. I guarantee you if we had that attitude, we would be able to win back many brothers and sisters who are separated from the church. 
It means that you love and you pray for this person, but you do not permit them to enjoy the good fruit of fellowship. It means you do not consider them part of your congregation. It means you are polite and kind and patient and ready to forgive and welcome back, but they must know that their repentance is required first. If we follow this teaching in trying to deal with unrepentant sinners who offend us or the church, we would eliminate cliques and feuds and personal division between brethren and we would demonstrate that we're not afraid to discipline the immoral, the divisive and the unfaithful. Maybe they'd get the idea that we actually love their souls. We love them, you know, little children, right? We, we have to love them enough to do what? To discipline them. Well, in the church, we need to love our brethren enough to discipline them even if that is what is called for. All right, so another example we have in the New Testament dealing with enemies, and that is dealing with the brother who is unaware of his offense against you. This time, Luke, uh, 11 and I'll get there in a minute. This is the trickiest situation because sometimes we're hurt by people who never intended to offend us or who are completely unaware that they have by their words or by their deeds. Uh, they don't know that they've made you feel bad. Now we usually have several options with them. First, um, we feel bad and secretly, well, we just hate them. <laughs> We write them off. Used to be friend, used to be you know, brother, you know, we just scratch them off. We give them, as I say, the partial silent treatment, hoping that they'll figure out something is wrong. This rarely works and it causes more bad feelings, but this time on both sides, because you know, the person who's done the offending but is not aware of it is starting to get bad vibes from that person, and that person now is thinking, what's wrong with that guy? How come he got up? Now, now the originally guilty party, he's the innocent party now because he's offended at your silent treatment. Secondly, go to them and tell them about what has happened and how you feel. I believe that most brethren will apologize saying they didn't mean it, they weren't aware of it. But you end up feeling foolish and immature. That's the risk. It's like cornering someone where they have no chance but to either insult you some more or apologize, a lot of little satisfaction. Or we can simply do what Jesus says, forgive everyone who is indebted to us, Luke 11 verse four. To freely forgive someone who has offended us but is unaware is truly not letting the right hand know what the left hand is doing and so much more satisfying than demanding an apology. Okay, so we've dealt with the repeat offender, the unrepentant offender, the brother who is unaware of his offense. One last category that we have to include dealing with of, uh, enemies. Dealing with the brother that you offend. Like you're the guilty one, because we've all been talking about you know, when, when you're the innocent one. What happens when you're the guilty one? When you're the one that has done the offense? Uh, Matthew 5, 23 and 4, this is the last one. Jesus says, therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering. Now this situation is the easiest to understand, but it's the most difficult to accomplish. We know in our hearts when we are wrong, and as Christians we know what we should do. But a lot of times we put it off, the, you know, I said, you know, I shot my mouth off and I know that I hurt Brother Joe. You know, I hurt his feeling, I could see it on his face, because I know that's a sensitive area for, you know, whatever, whatever reason, okay? And you know what? We're Sunday night, it's getting late, I need to run out next Sunday or Wednesday. But then Wednesday, you know, Joe works on Wednesday night. He doesn't come, well, we'll do it next Sunday. Oh, wait a minute, next Sunday, well, we're going out. You know what I'm saying? We just keep putting it off. Or we rationalize it by saying, well, it's no big deal. They'll get over it. I wouldn't be offended if somebody said that to me. <laughs> 
Or we blame the other person for provoking us. Yeah, well, if he, you know, if he didn't do this, I wouldn't have done that. You know, sooner or later, we have to face God to praise Him or to make our requests known to Him. And He says that these things will fall on deaf ears unless we are right with our brothers first. How can we be sincere in our love for God if we consciously are the enemy of someone else and do nothing to make peace with them? How can we do that? So we need to remember that in situations where the offense is between brothers and sisters in Christ, the objective is not to win the argument or win an apology. The objective is to win the brother or the sister and restore the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace at the level that we had before or even greater. And the thing that I have found whenever resolving a dispute with a brother or sister and really having an open heart, honest, sincere, uh, a loving discussion, I have found in my experience the relationship with that person is even stronger in the future. You love that person even more in the future because you, the both of you have managed to work something out and you've managed to do it with the same objectives, under the same motivation. You love Christ, He loves Christ. You want peace, He wants peace. You want to do the right thing, He wants to do the right thing. Boy, when those things are working together, that's, boy, you're, you're welded together in Christian love when you're able to do things like that. Remember, the only person who wants division in the church is Satan. He's the only person who's happy when that, when that happens. So in the end, dealing with our enemies, whether they be Christians or non-Christians, involves our reacting with Christian love to their actions. When it comes to dealing with the offenses of our enemies against us, God requires the most difficult expression of that love. The one that sees us dying to self, facing our fear of rejection and hurt, in order to save someone we don't particularly care about at that moment. This is what loving your enemy is all about. First Peter 4.8 says, love covers a multitude of sins. Peter doesn't say that love justifies or excuses sins, but rather that love through its humbling efforts will restore their brother's soul and in doing so will cover their sins with the blood of Christ and demonstrate clearly that we are true disciples of Jesus Christ. So when considering these things, what do you think your need is as far as dealing with your enemies is concerned? Do you need to give up fighting your enemy and begin witnessing to your enemy instead? Do you need to deny your pride and stubbornness and reach out to someone who needs to find forgiveness from God and from you? Or do you need to seek forgiveness for yourself for something that you have done, something that you are hiding? The Lord encourages you to go to those who need your witness or who need your forgiveness or come to Him for your own forgiveness this evening as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.